Let's look at these announcements. I've given you homework number one, and part of the homework is to go walk around in the parking lot over there. And it's probably best to do that in the afternoon when there's not as many cars because part of that assignment that I gave you is that you should walk around the parking lot and try and find out where is the high point because all of the water in that, in theory, could drain to one location where you'd need to put in a drain if there was a curb running along the sidewalk. So in that homework assignment, you're supposed to walk along and try and get an idea of where is the break point that will cause water to drain one direction and it's easiest to do that if there's not cars in the way. People are going to wonder why there's lots of engineers walking around in the parking lot next to the engineering building. They're going to think that the engineers are lost or something. Um, but let me know if you've got any questions on that assignment. It's due on Tuesday. Now, the first part of that assignment has to do with design using the rational method. And we're going to work a couple of examples today uh, to get you ready for completing the first part of that homework assignment. Um, I already mentioned that Google Earth Pro is a good way of calculating the area. So that if you go into the parking lot and you find out where you think the ridge line is, then you can look at the aerial photo of that and use the uh, measure area tool. And then you'll be able to calculate the area very easily. Otherwise, you can pace it out or estimate. Is there a question? Everybody have the notes they need? What's that? Everybody's fine? OK, good. Uh, also, yesterday I sent you an email about it installing StormCAD in your computer. And Bentley, who we pay a subscription fee to, allows students to download. And so the select server is where you can download the installation files and the prerequisites. To get StormCAD, I think there's a total of four files that you have to install. There's the prerequisites, the iModel engine, the actual StormCAD file, and then a patch. And so when you go to find those files on the Bentley website, it will prompt you to, uh, to download all four of those files. Um, because everybody's got a different computer, it's tough to give too much technical support on that. I can help you out if you run into some uh, simple problems, but you know, anything too complex, you may need to call Bentley Technical Support to ask them why it's not installing, if it's not installing. But um, let me know if you have any trouble with that. And we're going to start using StormCAD next Tuesday. We'll have a, uh, most of the class lecture on Tuesday. Is there an extra copy of the notes? There should be, because I printed out 19. The parking situation's worse than ever, right? I got here yesterday at uh, about 8.50, and there was no faculty parking available. I, I could barely get a spot at the football stadium. So, All right. Well, today we're going to talk about, oh, and there's a quiz next Tuesday. Quiz one next Tuesday. Um, so just to reiterate, I think that uh, being able to describe concepts is an important part of this class. And so you may want to look over the concept inventory I gave you on Tuesday and be able to describe in your own words some of the terms that we've covered so far. All right. Um, here is the example that we're going to take a look at today. And uh, everybody has a copy of that handout. And so let's look at the network. Um, there's a lot going on in this map. And in a way, I wish it was in color. It would make it a lot easier to understand. But let me do my best. We've got a, uh, like a suburb. And you can see that they're streets, Oregon, California. These are all streets with the dashed lines. And then this is the, uh, the suburban area. Now the long dash dot, long dash dot, that is delineating the areas that feed into inlets. And so 1.1 is a catchment. This is a drain that's in the middle of the road, and stormwater will flow to that drain. And the area that's contributing to that is this boundary, the solid boundary, and then the dashed line. All of the water from that area will go to inlet 1.1. And then it's going to flow through this pipe. And I think on your handout, I've labeled the pipes A, B, and C. And so this is pipe A that goes from inlet 1.1 up to inlet 2.1. 
And so the water flows into inlet 2.1 from this area, the dashed line um, all the way down to here, this dashed line over to the solid line up and around. Okay, so we've got also a pipe going from 2.1 to 3.1. Now, this network continues much further. This is a figure from the textbook, but I've truncated it just to make our illustration example a little bit easier to digest today. Um, so any questions about this picture so far and how to interpret it? The elevations that are shown, this is ground elevation, and so the ground is sloping towards the top of the page. Uh, 300, uh, 735 feet, 730, 725, and so on. And in the information I've given you, there's also the, uh, I should have kept one of these for myself. There's the invert elevation. What that means is that's the bottom of the pipe at each junction. Uh, that's the, where the, the manhole is down at. If you've got a street at ground level, and then here's our grate, where water comes in and then there's a manhole that goes down and there's pipes. And so the invert elevation is talking about what is the elevation here. Invert elevation. And if you know that this is 1.1 and here is inlet 2.1 and it also has the grate where water can come in, the water is sloping, uh, water is following the slope and the slopes are defined in the pipe table it tells you the length of each pipe, the slope, and then the upstream junction, meaning where the water is coming from, and the downstream junction means where the water is going to. And so the water that's going in there is from the catchments 1.1, 1.2. I've identified the area of each catchment, the C value, which remember that runoff coefficient gives an idea of how impervious the soil and the land use are. And so if you have a high C value, like catchment 1.2, it looks like that's a lot of concrete and a lot of roofs because it has the highest C value of 0.8. But then catchment 1.1 has the lowest C value of uh, 0.65. What we're going to do today is set up a spreadsheet that kind of automatically calculates how big the pipe size should be. And automatically is probably too optimistic a word for what it does because we're going to be typing in the equations directly. On the second sheet of that paper, at the bottom is Manning's equation that's been rearranged for diameter. What you'll remember is that Manning's equation relates flow rate, uh, Q equals area to the 5 thirds power slope to the one-half power, um, N and the wetted perimeter to the two-thirds. Boy, it's been a long summer for everybody. So that's Manning's equation. And what we've done at the bottom of that uh, spreadsheet printout, which is actually the solution to the example we're working, is rearrange Manning's equation for diameter, where we know that um, area is pi b squared divided by 4. So if I substitute in this expression for area and the wetted perimeter for a pipe that is uh, full, so the wetted perimeter is um, pi d, uh, no, it's uh, d divided by 4 because its um, hydraulic radius is area divided by wetted perimeter. So the wetted perimeter is just the uh, pi d. That's right, pi d. So the uh, formula that's there is rearranging Manning's equation where we've got some m value that depends on the unit system we're using. And in this example, we're going to use traditional units, BG units. The n value is the roughness of the pipe, and at the top of the solution it says, let's assume the n value is 0 0.014, and then the slope that we should use is the given slope of the pipe itself. So what I'd like you to do is open up Excel, 
and start to type in the column headings and then we're going to go through together how to set up the solution of this example. So we're going to want to have the uh, pipe name, length, slope, upstream junction, downstream junction, area, the C value, C times the area, and then sum of C times the area. Time to inlet. Basically just copying down all of the headings so that we can follow a pretty organized procedure. <laughs> All right, so let me uh, take a copy of this picture over here. So what do we know about our network? Um, we know that there are three pipes that we're going to be designing, pipe A, pipe B, and pipe C. All right. Uh, the given length for pipe A, if you're looking at the table there, it says that pipe A has a length of 390 feet, pipe B 183, and pipe C is 177 feet. That's just from the information on this table. Okay, the slope is how steep is the pipe, and that information actually matches the invert elevation. If you find the, the difference in invert elevation between 1.1 and 2.1 and divide it by the length, that would give you this slope that's listed here. So everything matches up. The slope, 0 0.02, 0 0.0041, and 0 0.0245. The given information there. Okay, now the upstream junction and downstream junction, that information isn't going to work its way into calculations. It's more just to help us keep straight um, what inlets are feeding into which, which areas. And so if we look, you know, pipe A has 1.1 upstream and 2.1 downstream. Pipe B has 1.2 and it flows towards 2.1 and pipe C goes from 2.1 to 3.1. So 1.1 to 2.1, 1.2 to 2.1, and then 2.1 to 3.1. Please feel free to ask questions if you've got them. There's, uh, there's no bad question. We've got 1.1 to 2.1. Do I? Yeah, I'm looking at the wrong one, I guess. All right, so I've got, oh, upstream elevations and downstream elevation. Yeah, let's do that. So I can uh, add that, insert it here, insert there. Thanks for pointing that out. So upstream elevation, 
in feet. We won't actually use that in calculations, but I want to be consistent, so I'm glad you mentioned it. Downstream elevation in feet. All right, so the elevations we can get from that table that's provided. The upstream elevation is uh, 730.5, Originally, I actually calculated the um, invert elevations from the slopes that are given, I, not the other way around. 722.7, 722.7, and 718.36. Why are these two the same? That's right. It's because both of these pipes, pipe A and pipe B, go to the same junction. They both flow towards 2.1. So that's not a mistake. It's okay for the downstream junction to be the same elevation for both of those. In fact, it has to be. Otherwise, it would be, it would be an error. All right. Now, the area that it's talking about is how big of an area is feeding water into this inlet. And so, uh, Inlet 1.1, the area there is 2.2 uh, acres. It is um, 1.2 acres and 3.9 acres is feeding into junction um, into pipe C. Now, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this column here is talking about just the area that directly connects to the inlet 2.1. So that 3.9, even though through pipe C, there's water flowing from this inlet, that one, and that one. There's three inlets that feed this pipe. So far, we haven't done any summing operation. This uh, 3.9 that I just typed in, that is only the water that enters pipe C through inlet 2.1. Later on in the uh, sum of CA column is where we will add up the three components of the flow. So that's an important point uh, to mention is that this column, and there is, uh, by the way, these definitions that saying what each column consists of. And so for the area, I guess uh, area is self-explanatory. It looks like I didn't give you a definition for area, but I'm giving you one now. It's only referring to the flow that's coming in from the inlet that is the upstream inlet. And so area column, the area that contributes to flow considering the upstream junction that is listed in that row. Now the C values are just directly from the table data that's provided. So the C values that we have for catchment 1.1 1 .1 is 0 0.65, 1 1.2 is 0 0.8, and 0 0.7 is the C value for catchment 2.1. So if it makes it more understandable, we could call this the upstream junction or we could call it catchment because the upstream junction is really what defines the catchment for each of these pipes, at least the, uh, the catchment that's directly connected to the inlet of that pipe. Now, C times A is just what you'd expect. We're going to do a formula now, so if you type equals, that tells Excel that it's going to begin a formula. So equals the area times the C value. So it's the, uh, the product of those two columns. If we type enter, then it automatically multiplies 2.2 and 0.65. That's where the 1.43 get comes from. Okay, so again, that's equals area times C value. And then um, 
we can, this little corner here, we don't have to type in the formula three times. We can just drag it down. So you notice that there's this uh, extra thick square that's green. If we click there with the mouse and drag it down, then it applies the same formula to each row. So it is, if I highlight here, it's this cell times that cell. If we go down, it's this cell times this cell. So there's a couple of ways to get that. We can either click and drag like I just showed you, or if we want the cell to fill in, you can just double click on that corner and automatically fills the formula down. So I double click there and it fills this, the formula through. Any questions so far? Okay, now some of the CA is a little bit tricky. What you have to ask for this column is, um, what's the total amount of contributing area upstream of that pipe? So for pipe A, the only water that is in pipe A, it only comes in from one junction. And for pipe B, it only comes into a single junction. But now pipe C has water coming in from three different locations. It has the water coming in directly through the inlet that's upstream of that pipe. It has water coming in through pipe A and water coming in through pipe B. So in this row, we're going to have to consider the sum of all the CA values. So it is just equal to that for the first one because there's only one inlet. Also, only one inlet for pipe B. But now in pipe C, it is the sum of all three of the CA values because there's uh, three inlets that contribute to the flow in pipe C. All right. Looks pretty good. Everybody doing fine? Let me know if you have a question. All right, time to inlet says, how long does it take for the water to travel from the edge that's furthest away from the inlet till the inlet? So it's the flow over the surface. If it's water moving over a flat, grassy surface, the time to inlet would be very high. If it's water that's flowing over a steep, smooth, a concrete surface, then the time to inlet would be slow. But each one of these inlets has a different amount of time it takes for the water to travel to it. And so that's provided in the table data where it says, uh, in this column it says time of concentration. That's what we're going to use in this time to inlet. So the time of concentration where it says 11.0 minutes and then for the upstream catchment of 1.2, it is 9.2 and 13.7. That's how long it takes for the water to flow to the inlet in each of those cases. All right. Now, flow route is going to be something that helps us to decide what's the path for the longest time of concentration when we have multiple different routes to get there. And so the water is flowing over the land, over surface. And so when I say over land, what I'm talking about is for this third pipe, for pipe C, remember that there's three different routes that the water takes to get into the pipe. Either the water is flowing over the surface and entering through the grates, or water gets into that pipe C from pipe A or from pipe B. So we have to consider all three of those routes when we are sizing the third pipe, pipe C. So it's overland. And then there is also from, uh, oh, well, overland. 
But then there's two other routes. The water can enter pipe C from pipe 1.1 or from pipe 1.2. And we don't know yet how long it takes to get there. We are going to fill these in, but we don't have the information we need to fill it in yet. So I'm going to just put those blanks there to remind me I have to fill in that information later on when I calculate how quickly the water flows from the, uh, through the pipe. <clears throat> All right. Um, upstream flow time only applies if there's water that's coming from the pipe, and so I have to fill that in as a blank. I, I'm going to leave that blank right now for these, but it doesn't apply um, in this instance because the water isn't flowing. Uh, through a pipe if it's overland flow. So I'm just going to put zero for those columns. Time of concentration is equal to, it's the time to inlet plus the upstream flow time. So if I add the two together, it's the, just going to only be the time to inlet if it is the uh, overland flow route. but in some cases, if you have a really long pipe, then what we would have to do is use the, uh, the longer of the flow routes if you're considering the, the one that includes the pipe. So I have another blank here that I can't fill in yet. I have to complete all of the overland flow calculations before I can do the pipe calculations. And so I'm filling in these just to remind me I have to come back to it later and do the calculations. Uh, all I did in TC was I just, uh, I did this. I did the cell format to give it borders. Oh, you're talking about here. Oh, no, it's the formula of time to inlet plus the up, upstream flow time. Some of these columns seem re repetitive, um, but later on when the network gets more complicated, you have to start making decisions about what's the longest flow path. And it won't be as repetitive if you have a complicated network where there's lots of different routes that water can take to get to a certain location. So um, it seems repetitive now, but it always won't be. T sub D is also going to be just this if it's an overland flow route. But for this one, we don't know yet because this T sub D has to look at the longest of the T sub, Z, T sub C values. And so when I come back to pipe C, pipe C is the complicated one because remember, water enters pipe C from three different spots. It can either come in directly it can come in from pipe B or from pipe A. And so this final column that I'm filling in right now, the T sub D, asks the question, what is the longest amount of time it takes for water to get into the pipe? Is it the longest for the water to flow over the surface and into the pipe? Or is it longer for water to flow over this surface and then travel through the pipe and then arrive there? Or is it to flow over this surface enter the pipe, and then the travel time as the water moves through the pipe. And so there's three different possibilities, and we have to select the longest of those three possibilities. But where it's just overland flow, then we select, already we know there's no multiple options that have to be considered. Now I is the uh, rainfall intensity, and you have a table here, the IDF table. Intensity, duration, frequency table. And you're going to use the T sub D value to find out the rainfall intensity. So if the uh, T sub D value is 11 minutes, you go here and you find out from the IDF table that at 11 minutes, the rainfall intensity is 4 inches per hour. And what this table means is that if a storm is very short, it's easier for that storm to have a high intensity for a short amount of time. But the longer a storm is, 
you don't have the same intensity during that entire storm duration. So a storm that lasts one hour is going to have a lower intensity than a storm that is, uh, is very short. So think about a running race. If you have a long duration running race, the intensity or the speed of the race is going to be lower than if it's a very short duration sprint. And, you know, that's an analogy to how storms are. A storm that lasts just a short period can have a higher intensity. So in our case, if you have 11 minutes, then from this table, it looks like 11 minutes is 4 inches per hour, 9.2 minutes. If we go to the table, it looks like at 9.2, it is an intensity, I guessed, of 4.3 inches per hour. Now, for Q sub P, that is where we're going to find the uh, Manning's equation. I'm not Manning's equation, sorry, the, the rational method. Q equals CIA. So equals CA, so CA times intensity. Remember the formula that I showed you last time. We already have one column that says C times A, and so we're, we're multiplying the CA column times the I column. Power? Oh, okay. All right. I thought maybe it wasn't logging in. <clears throat> Any questions right now? Okay, so what that means, 5.72, how did it come up with that's the peak flow rate? Why is it guessing that on our map, it is saying that for this storm, we should expect 5.72 cubic feet per second is the highest amount of water that has to go into this grating there. Um, so if it's a longer time of concentration, then the intensity would have been lower. Um, but also a long time of concentration usually comes from a larger area. And so you're sort of balancing different parts of the uh, rational equation. You'd have a bigger area then that increases A, but it will decrease the time of concentration, and therefore it's going to decrease the intensity of the stormfall. Um, so we have the, uh, the peak flow that's going to be entering that, and then the required pipe diameter is where we've rearranged Manning's equation, and we're going to type in this formula, the D sub R formula that's at the bottom of the page there. So I'm going to say equals parentheses MD, which in our case, because we're using BG units, is 2.16 times Q. So here is Q times N. And the N value for this pipe is 0 0.014 divided by the square root SQRT of the slope for this particular pipe. And then all of that is to the power of 3 divided by 8. I'll leave that formula up for a second if you want to look at that. It's saying how big the pipe will have to be in order to accommodate 5.72 CFS. It should say 
that it's required 1.08. Yeah, okay. have this set up in Portuguese or style? Okay. Yeah, comma is fine then, right? Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Now, uh, square root of, and now you go to the slope. Yeah. Close parentheses. Close again. Parentheses. Power. Yep. Good. Nice. It's okay? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. If you press enter, it says 1.08. Good. Here it's the slope, so you'll need to, uh, yeah. yeah. So and then close parentheses again, and then to the power of 3 divided by 8. Yeah. Perfect. There it is. Got it? Okay, so we find out the pipe required is 1.08 feet. Now there's only one problem. Like I mentioned last time in class, they don't make pipe sizes exactly 1.08 feet. The nearest pipe size that's available, this D sub N, that means the nominal pipe diameter, you can only buy either a 1 foot pipe or 1.25. And if we use a one-foot pipe, it will be too small. And so we have to round up to the nearest commercially available pipe size. 1.25 is the size that's actually available. And for flow velocity, um, we, we will do Q, uh, we will use V equals Q divided by A. And so equals the flow rate, Q, divided by the area, assuming that it's flowing full, we'll keep it easy, um, it would be uh, pi 3.14 times d squared divided by 4. Yeah. Now the pipe actually won't be flowing full, but you remember what we had to do to calculate cross-sectional areas of non-full pipes last semester. It's going to be mostly full. So you'll remember the continuity equation says Q equals V times A. And so if we want to find V, it's going to be Q divided by area. And so V is Q divided by pi D squared divided by 4. And that's what's typed in on the screen there. Okay, let's see. 2.16. Uh, yeah, okay, 2.16. R2. too many zeros, point zero 0.02. Okay, so get the flow velocity in, 
The same thing is true here. We can't use a point 1 point, 1.28, so we have to use 1.50. That's the nearest available size. And so then this will calculate the velocity based on that pipe diameter. Yeah, you just type it. Yeah. The the for the file the column for d sub n, there's no formula for that. Maybe you have to go to the website of who is making the pipe and you find out what pipe sizes they have available. And so you're typing in 1.25 or 1.5 based on some research you're doing to find out what's the actual pipe sizes that you can purchase for the project. And so then we find velocity and then the last thing, this flow time, is telling you how long it takes if your velocity is 4.6 feet per second and the length of the pipe we previously have identified as 390 feet. How many seconds or how many minutes in this case does it take to flow that far? So it is going to be the distance of 390 feet divided by the flow velocity and that gives us how many seconds it's going to take and then divide by 60 to get minutes. So 1.39 minutes is the flow time through that pipe. That's how long it takes the water to get from this inlet to the outlet of the pipe. All right, so there's a couple of things that we haven't looked at yet, and that is the decision point where <clears throat> the water might be, you know, how big to make pipe C. We have to look at is the amount of water in pipe C going to be governed mostly by the flow that's coming into the inlet or the flow from the pipes that are connected to it. So if the water is going to be coming, if the governing time is from 1.1, then we have to use the time to inlet for 1.1 and then also the flow duration. So it would be the, uh, the 11 minutes that we have for 1.1 of the time to inlet and then also this flow time. And so the upstream flow time, that's where I'm going to say equals and use this cell over here and then add the two together. So in this column I was adding things together. So 12.4 uh, minutes is how long it takes to the water if the water is going to be flowing over the surface of the land and then through the pipe before it gets to junction 2.1. Or if we're looking at pipe 1.2, uh, the inlet 1.2, we need to find the overland flow duration and then the pipe flow time. And so it was 9.2 minutes of overland flow plus the flow time of 1.31 minutes. And so we've got the sum of that available now. <clears throat> 10.5. So I have to look at which of those three is the largest and it looks like 13.7 is the largest of those three values and so what is going to govern the intensity I use is the longest of the three. And so equals, I'm going to say equals and that one. But if one of the others was longer, then I would use whichever one is biggest. This, this, or this. So I'll have it refer to the 13.7. And then remember the way that we find the intensity 
is we look at the table. So for 13.7 minutes, it looks like the intensity is, my guess was 3.68. Boy, that's, that's awfully optimistic that I can distinguish 3.68, but that's what I thought. And then the peak, I can use the same formula. I already had the equation there, so I can just drag it down, and it will find, using Manning's equation, what the peak flow is. Boy, that's really big. All of a sudden, it's so large. Why is that 18 CFS? Why is it so much bigger than the other two were? Any ideas why 18 CFS when the other ones were just 4 or 5 CFS? That's right. It's got all three of the areas. It's, it's a lot of flow going through that pipe because it's the water that's coming into this junction and it's the flow from both of the other pipes. So all three of the connected areas are contributing to that peak flow. Okay, and the diameter required, I can carry that equation through. If it is uh, 1.62, the next commercially available pipe size would be 1.75. And you get it from the IDF curve. And actually, what I'm doing here is uh, trying to make one of the author's examples a little bit easier to understand, and 3.68 is the value that's from that example. So I was just trying to be consistent with that example. If I'd looked at it myself, I probably wouldn't have said 3.68. Maybe I would have said 3.7, you know. But that's what's in that author's example, and so I stuck with it. <clears throat> so I can get the flow velocity and the flow time. All right. So the main thing the example said to do, determine the required conduit size. Basically, the example is asking how big should the pipe be? And you're doing two things simultaneously in the spreadsheet. You know, just to give you the overview, you're doing both the hydrology and the hydraulics in that spreadsheet. The hydrology says, what is the Q? You know, it looks at the land area. It looks at the rainfall intensity looks at the C values. The hydrology says, how big is the peak flow rate from the storm? And then the hydraulic says, if we have a certain peak flow rate Q, what is the required pipe size that's needed to carry that water towards its outlet? So we're doing both steps of the hydrology hydraulics here in the spreadsheet. They don't have to be. Actually, they, they could be in the K column as well, since they're the same. <coughs> yeah. But in this case, you want it to be all of the area, not just the, uh, the, the area that's connected directly. You want it to be the area that's included from the other pipes as well. OK, so that's all the time we can afford to spend on this example. Save the file that you've been working on. If you haven't already, save it because on Tuesday what we're going to do is we're going to use um, StormCAD to double check this. You have to learn it the hard way before I let you do it the easy way. As you might guess, StormCAD is a lot simpler than typing all this out in the equations by hand. But we'll use, we'll use this as one of our illustration examples when I'm teaching you StormCat on next Tuesday. So save your file. Any questions before we move on? Okay, that's all we're going to be using the computers for today. You can uh, shut the computer down now. You don't necessarily have to put it back into the cart right away, but we won't be using the computers anymore today. So 
column, the column, in the example that we were just doing, what did uh, this column come from? You know, how did we know that it takes 11 minutes? I should have said time to inlet is in units of minutes, by the way. How did we know it took 11 minutes for the water to travel over land to the outlet 1.1? Or how did we know, you know, from, from here, how did we know it was 11 minutes? Or how could we find out the amount of time that it takes for water to go into junction 1.2 from the edge towards here? Well, the rest of today we're going to be talking about time of concentration methods. And overland flow is what's talked about when um, you have not, not water that is in a channel, but it's just water flowing over the surface. And it's called a Hortonian overland flow. And you maybe have seen the movie Horton Hears a Who, right? So I don't think this is named after that Horton necessarily. But if it helps you remember that it's called Hortonian overland flow, um, the infiltration capacity of the land has been exceeded. So, you know, water can percolate into the soil pores only at a certain rate. And when the rainfall exceeds that rate, then there's going to be runoff. And so runoff that's flowing over the land as a sheet or in very shallow concentrated flow, um, we have to have some methods for calculating the velocity of that flow over the surface. And the methods that we're going to look at today do that but they have a variety of different acquired data. Um, so the kinematic wave is one of the most sophisticated ways of calculating how long it takes the water to flow from one point to another over the land. And if you look at the different parameters that go into this equation, it gives you an idea of what sort of data you have to, available, have, to have available to make an estimate. So, this formula says that if you want to find out how long it takes, the time it takes for water to flow from one point to another, obviously you need to know the length that the water is flowing. So L is one of the most important variables because if water has to flow a short distance, it's going to take longer, uh, less time than if it's a long distance. So that's obvious. This formula also takes the N value into account, N value being the Manning's roughness coefficient. And that's in the numerator of the equation, which means that if you have a high end value or a rough surface, that's going to increase the amount of time it takes to flow from one point to another. So the end value for a grass-lined area might be uh, you know, 0.05 compared to the end value for a, a concrete area, 0.015. Um, so a big difference in the n values is going to give you longer time for a surface that is more rough. Now, down in the denominator is the slope, for one thing. And so what's the effect of having slope in the denominator? denominator? Think about a big slope. If you have a big slope, just conceptually, you're expecting that the water will flow fast if there's a big slope. And so it's going to take less time for the water to flow from one point to the other. And so that's what happens by having the slope in the denominator of this equation is that if you have a big slope value, that means it's very steep. And so a large slope is going to decrease the amount of time of concentration. So hopefully that should be self-explanatory. But now I, intensity. Why is it you think that the rainfall intensity is in the denominator of this equation? And what does that mean? What's the practical effect of having the rainfall intensity in the denominator? The harder it rains, the quicker the water it goes. Yeah, that's the effect of it. And conceptually, we can think about it in that uh, if it's raining really hard, um, <coughs> the surface is getting wet in front of the flow path. And so here we've got a slope, and we need a raindrop to travel from A to B. Now, if this surface is pretty dry already, then the raindrop is going to travel very slowly because it's a, a very thin sheet of water. And if the, the sheet of water is thin, then most of the flow is in direct contact with the resistance surface. Remember that the surface, the concrete or the grass, 
is going to be resisting flow. It's pushing back. So as the water wants to flow downhill, whatever that surface is, is resisting the flow direction. But if it's raining really hard, then there's going to be already a cushion of water on top of the flow surface. And so the raindrop is traveling on top of that cushion of water, and it's further away from the resistance surface that's trying to hinder its progress towards B. And so a very high rainfall intensity means it's able to travel more quickly from A to B. And so the kinematic wave approach is actually very sophisticated. It has a lot of variables that have to be defined. Most of the other methods that we're going to look at don't have the same level of precision as the kinematic wave. And that's okay. You don't always have all this information. You may not know exactly what the rainfall intensity is. You just want to have a basic idea of the time of concentration in a general sense. Um, or you may not be able to, to tell exactly what the end value is for the surface. But any of the other methods that don't include these parameters are going to have some potential for error if the method that you're applying doesn't necessarily match up with the field conditions that, uh, that exist. And so let's look at one of the other approaches. Um, by the way, here are some end values for overland flow. The end values for overland flow are sometimes a little bit different from the end values that you'd use in channel design. And so uh, you can look up what is the end value if you've got water trying to flow overland uh, for bare sand, concrete, you can see, you know, grass, 0.45, that's a very high end value. It's going to be providing a lot of resistance to the flow as it goes over the top of bluegrass. Um, okay, so the NRCS method, I use the NRCS method more than anything else when I'm doing watershed modeling just because it's, uh, it's a little bit easier to, to use than uh, some of the other approaches. But what you can see is that it's not using the I in the same way. It, it does have a measure of rainfall amount, but it's asking you what's the rainfall amount for a two-year, 24-hour storm. It's not asking you what's the rainfall amount for the actual storm that is in question. And so this is an empirical equation that was calibrated of, over lots of different conditions, and they just get observed data and create the equation from observed data. This is not a fundamental equation that's based on the realities of physics. Uh, but it still does have a lot of the parameters in here that we know is going to affect the flow. It's got slope, end value, length. And then this factor here, 0 0.0288, that's just the factor that um, empirically, when, when you're curve fitting data, is used to make the data match up with what's observed. So um, you'll notice that this is only valid for a flow distance of about 100 meters at the longest. Um, and the reason for that is that if you have flow, a sheet flow for more than 100 meters, then it's going to start to get together in uh, really deeper pools that flows more as a channel than as overland flow. So in other words, if you think about <coughs> like a, a big area, if you have a, a big area, and so, you know, the water's flowing as a sheet this way. If you go more than 100 meters, there's so much water, then it's going to find where's the lowest point here, and it's going to start to pool together naturally wherever the lowest point is. And then from here, it may be overland flow for part of it. But then it transitions into shallow, concentrated flow. And overland flow, you're finding how long does it take to get from point A to point B. And then shallow, concentrated flow is just... Um, it's acting more like a channel, and so you'd maybe have the low point of the parking lot, and you'd start to use Manning's equation <coughs> to find the flow velocity. And um, so these all have upper limits of how long you can say is valid for the 
time of concentration. Now the Kerr pitch method, now this doesn't take the end value into account. It doesn't take any storm data into account. It's just the length and the slope. And there is correction factors that you use based on if it would be a grass line channel versus concrete channel. It has these correction factors, but in this case it says that it's valid for watersheds less than 80 hectares for the overland flow component of the, the flow inside, inside that watershed. Um, there's another one called Izzard. And by the way, all of these different methods are summarized in your text. And uh, I, I think in your homework assignment, I ask you to uh, try calculating the time of concentration for the parking lot according to these different methods. Uh, you can see the Izzard approach asks you to calculate um, a K value depending on the slope and the retardance coefficient. The retardance coefficient is kind of like a roughness value in a way. <coughs> Here's an equation called Kirby. It's for very small watersheds less than four hectares with a very shallow slope less than one percent, a length less than 365. So just to give you an idea of how these different equations compare to each other, let's use these five equations for the same the same area, and it will illustrate how different the answers can be. Let's compare kinematic wave to NRCS, compare that to Kerpich, compare it to Izzard, Kirby. And we're told this is a grassy area with an average slope of 1.5%. And we want to find out how long it's going to take for water to flow 75 meters. The storm duration is 20 minutes and we have the rainfall duration. So for kinematic wave, the formula here, the time of concentration is 6.99 n times L, 0.6 power, I to the 0.4 power, and slope to the 0.3. Okay, so we can substitute in the given data here and find that the n value is 0.15 for a uh, grassy area. I found the n value for this grassy area off of table 5.17. So not, not this table. I have a, a different table that I used uh, for grass short prairie grass, 0.15, so that's sort of in the range that's used for this example here. That's where the n value came from. And our length is uh, 75 meters. Take that to the 0 0.6 power. Now the rainfall intensity here is given as 45 millimeters per hour. to the 0 0.4 power, and then the slope is 0 0.015 to the 0 0.3 power. Okay, so put all those into the calculator, and it tells us that it's going to take 22.96 minutes. That's the prediction that comes out of kinematic wave. And you can think of kinematic wave as probably the most accurate because it takes into account most of the physical variables that dictate flow time. NRCS method, by contrast, um, asks us to find out the precipitation depth for a 24-hour uh, storm. Well, we don't have a 24-hour storm. We know that this is a 20-minute storm and that it's going to have an intensity of 45 millimeters per hour. So already we're having to make a compromise in the data that's asking for. But let's just say we're going to let P equals 45 millimeters per hour. And this is uh, 20 minutes out of 60, so 2 sixths of an hour. It was 15 millimeters.
1.5 centimeters is the precipitation depth. If it was a 24-hour storm, it would probably be more than that, but this is just the rainfall data that we're going to use for the comparison. And so the, uh, the time of concentration for the NRCS method is 0 0.0288 times N times L to the 0 0.8 power the two-year storm precipitation depth to the 0.5 power and slope to the 0.4. And we'll substitute in the known data for that, 0 0.0288. The end value that we're using is 0.15 for this grass and 75 meters of length to the 0 0.8 power. And we're dividing by 1.5 centimeters of rainfall depth to the 0 0.5 power and 0 0.015 is the slope to the 0.4 power. Okay, that works out to a duration of 0 0.875 hours, so 52.5 minutes is the prediction for how long it's going to take. Now, part of the reason why that's so much bigger than here is that it's an overestimate because we probably should have more rainfall than this 1.5 centimeters. Remember that the storm it's talking about here, it said that it's 45 millimeters per hour for a 20 minute storm. But the NRCS method, this P2, is actually asking how much would there be during a 24-hour storm. So it's going to be more depth. And since that's in the denominator, that would bring the value down a little bit. So that's why this is uh, probably too large. Yeah? Um, because this intensity is for a short-duration storm. And remember that the shape of the IDF curve looks more like this. So this is intensity, and this is time. And so what we had was like a 20-minute a storm. And if we multiplied, if, if we just said, let's extrapolate that same intensity over 24 hours, that would be really overestimating how much water there was. What we probably ought to do is find a curve and so find one where it says, you know, up here the intensity for the 20-minute storm was 45 millimeters per hour. And, you know, find a curve that does that and then go find the 24-hour and then go back over. That would be, you know, one way of approaching it. <clears throat> Good question. Okay, any other questions uh, so far on the NRCS estimate? All right, we've just got a couple more minutes. I want to illustrate the, uh, <coughs> the Kerpich equation. Okay, Kerpich says that the time of concentration will be 0 0.019, the length to the 0.77 power, and the slope to the 0 0.385 power. All right. Um, so that is 0 0.019, the length was 75 meters, the 0.77 power, and the slope was 1, uh, sorry, it was 0 0.015 to the 0.385 power. Now that tells us it's only going to take 2.66 minutes, but if we go back to the Kerpich equation, it says that there's a multiplier for flow in, uh, in general overland flow. You double it. General overland flow. So uh, still, even when we do double it, so times 2, it gives us 5.32 minutes. That's still really low compared to what we say is the, the most accurate. And so why was Kerpich not very good? What didn't the Kerpich equation take into account? Well, it didn't take the, uh, 
the true end value into account. It just has this rule of thumb of doubling it. Um, and it also didn't take into account any rainfall intensity. So that gives you an idea of one of the weaknesses of throwing out some of the data that you otherwise would have. All right, we're out of time for today. The, the izzard, let me just give you the values for those. If you want to plug the values that we've got, the izzard would end up having a time of concentration of 38 minutes. And the Kirby ends up giving you an estimate of 18.8 minutes. If you want to go through and calculate those, those are the values that we should be looking for. Um, the main point of the example is just to illustrate the wide range of values you can get in estimating time of concentration. So let's jump back to a couple of announcements and refresh our memories that you've got a homework assignment due on Tuesday. The majority of that work that you need to do is rational method design like we had in the example today. It's a pretty simple couple of networks that it asks you to do in the homework. And also have StormCAD installed on your computer for next Tuesday and then that will allow you to work through the in-class examples we're going to do on your own machine rather than on the uh, tablets that are available.